Well, this will be a weird one. Usually when I make a video, I have some kind of specific story that I want to tell. Whenever I look at old technology, I begin by asking the question, what was its relevance at the time? What was its context? What made it interesting at one time and then not later? And with a lot of products, I have to ask the even bigger question, was it ever interesting? And I do a bunch of research to find out the answers to those questions as best I can, and I hope I get it more right than wrong. But I'm no different than any other nerd, really. So there's plenty of stuff that I like just because I do, not because it has a fascinating history. I mean, some things just don't have any real mysteries to discover. You look at them and you say, I see what that does, and I see why nobody makes it anymore. And I'm never really sure how to present those things. Word processors were once a significant market category. Um, they haven't been for a very long time and for very good reasons. I own seven of them for some reason. I bought them over the course of the last year or so, and I don't really know why. Every time I bought one, it was very much a, uh, I just think they're neat moment. Uh, but they've sat on my shelf for close to a year. I've powered each one up, I've used it several times, and I've come up with nothing to say about any of them. They're completely self-explanatory. And I wanna to get to the good parts of this video, so I'm just gonna give you a whirlwind tour of this collection, such as it is. Fundamentally, word processors are an elaboration on electronic typewriters, which are in themselves an elaboration on the electric typewriter. This is one of those, and it's exactly what it sounds like. It's a typewriter with electric assistance. You don't have to press the keys as hard as a conventional typewriter, so it's faster and it takes less effort, but it's still just a typewriter. If you make a mistake, you're stuck with it. The ability to correct mistakes is mostly what defines electronic typewriters. Uh, this guy here, for instance, is a really low-end one. I think these were common in like the late 80s and 90s, and it's got a little LCD screen here. When you type on this thing, instead of printing every letter immediately, they all appear on the little screen. If you fill up a line or you press return, it prints everything you've entered, but up until that point, you can go back, erase what you've typed or make edits on that little screen, and then print it only when you're ready. So these aren't a replacement for Microsoft Word by any means, but I imagine they were a godsend for people who made one or two typos in a given line, but were otherwise decent typists. This guy here is another machine in the same category, just more expensive. Uh, it's still a typewriter with an LCD, but it's a better one. It's clearer, it's backlit, and it's wide enough to span a full page of text, uh, albeit only 16 lines at a time. This one acts a lot more like a computer. It has a 50,000 character memory, so you can write several pages of text before you have to print anything at all, or you can just never print anything uh, because this has a floppy drive here on the side. So you can save your documents and you can even exchange files with a PC. And this leads us to a very important observation. These are all computers. There's a CPU in there, and there's RAM, and there's a ROM chip with a program that it runs. These have all the same basic parts as an Apple II or even an IBM PC. I wouldn't be surprised if most of them were more sophisticated than an entire ZX Spectrum, in fact, since they're mostly considerably newer. And all word processors, in fact, came out after the home computer revolution began, so you could always have just bought a PC instead, and I'll talk briefly later about why someone might not have wanted to do that. But first, uh, we're far enough in to make another important observation you may have noticed yourself already. These are boring. I mean, Homestamogus even prints anything anymore, let alone text-only documents with fixed-width non-proportional fonts, because that's all you can do with these. They all use daisy wheel impact printer mechanisms. So there's an ink ribbon and a plastic wheel with different letter forms, and then a hammer strikes one through the other onto the page to make a letter. This sort of solution made nice, clean, crisp text for the standards of the 1980s, but there's no reason to care about them now. Cheap laser jet printers can do much better than these in every conceivable way. They can do different fonts and graphics and even color. Here, if you want a different font, you have to physically swap out the print wheel. And if you want graphics or proportional text or color, well, you just can't have those. I'm sure I also don't need to tell you that the software is far clunkier than anything you've used on a PC in your life. You can do some basic things like copy and paste, but it's far more tedious, and many things we take for granted are impossible, such as rich text, thanks to the daisy wheel printer. It just can't do italics or anything like that. And the list of what these can't do is longer than what they can, so if you think this all looks dull as dishwater, you're right, I think they are too. 
I picked all these machines up opportunistically and only later acknowledged that they had nothing noteworthy going on inside. What actually piqued my interest in word processors in the first place many years ago was seeing machines like this one. This is a Brother WP75, and it was made in the mid 80s, which means that it predates decent LCD technology. So it uses a CRT. Not only that, but a weird custom wide aspect ratio CRT. It's not like masked or anything. You can see it really is that wide. You're not gonna find something like this in pretty much anything else, maybe like some old EKG machine. So that's cool, right? It is incredibly bright. It has amber phosphors that are very easy on the eyes. And in every other way, it is no more interesting than these other machines. The beautiful striking amber readout on the first one I ever saw 20, 25 years ago made it lodge in my mind's craw. But once I actually got one, I found out that besides the display technology, it is exactly as dull as all the others. And at first it looks like it has lots of features. The keycaps all have these uh, labels on them with extra features it can do, but you realize very quickly that these are mostly replacements for physical controls on a typewriter uh, where they aren't just simple digital necessities. A bunch of them are related to margin adjustments, for instance, and a bunch more are just shortcuts for file operations. There is nothing remarkable here. And this is how it is when you're the kind of nerd that many of us are. You look at something and you go, wow, I wanna be near that. I want to be in, in some way involved with that, but there, there's no reason to do so. It confers no benefit. It does nothing intrinsically special. And nonetheless, I bought several more of these after this one. This is a Brother WP3410. Uh, it is a very cheap device and I care so little about it that I haven't even bothered keeping it in one piece. It was too much of a pain in the ass to put back together. Uh, now this thing at first looks like a very cheap electronic typewriter. Uh, you'll notice that there's no screen on it. There are some of these that have the whole computer deal, the CPU and the RAM and the whatnot, but no screen because they have no correction mechanism. So they lack a lot of the sophistication of the higher end word processors. And this can actually behave like that if you want. Whoops. Uh, well, I screwed that up, but you get the gist. So this can be a very, very simple device, but it's actually supposed to be quite a bit more because if we take a look at the side here, this has a nine pin plug, which is actually for a monitor. This is the monitor that brother sold with this thing. And uh, you've actually seen it before. I'll tell you where in a moment. If we plug this into the machine, there we go. We get a picture that very much resembles the one from the WP75 because this actually runs basically the same software as that thing. It's just several years newer. And as you can see, it's also not in the same weird ultra wide aspect ratio. This one's much more ordinary. And that's probably because this is actually just a normal PC monitor. We can plug this into an IBM PC with an MDA or Hercules graphics card, and it'll work perfectly. I actually did that back in my video on the Head Start Explorer. That's where you might've seen this before. Now that's not to say that this machine is PC based, but it does have some similar components. Here's a picture of the motherboard. We can see that it's built around a Hitachi version of a Z80 processor. So it's clearly not remotely x86 based, but over here is an HD6445 CRT controller. That's a, sort of like what we'd now call a GPU. And it's a close relative of the MC6845 controller used in the PC. Brother pretty much cloned the PC's graphics hardware in something not remotely PC related, probably because MDA monitors were already being manufactured for use with PCs, so it was cheap to rebrand them. Now, most of these are from the mid to late 80s, so they've got that very strong 80s energy with the amber screens and the squared off beige plastic affect and whatnot, but they continued being made well into the 90s, so the styling did eventually start to change. This guy, the Smith Corona PWP88D, looks a, a fair bit newer in its styling at least. I think it might still be from the very late 80s, but at any rate, uh, it does have a more modern looking white phosphor screen. And while that doesn't suck intrinsically, the way they implemented it does. 
Did you know that back in these days, word processors, even on PCs, almost all used black backgrounds by default? Whether you had an amber, a green, or even a white CRT, that was only the color of the text. The rest of the screen was usually black, so you weren't blasting yourself with intense glaring light for hours and hours while you were writing. In other words, dark mode is not a recent invention. White text on black was the default for decades, starting with the first electronic terminals and ending only in the GUI era, when what you see is what you get editors began actually showing you what the finished page would look like, which demanded the now standard black text on white background color scheme. Well, that was totally pointless on a dedicated word processor without any advanced page layout features, but Smith Corona apparently decided they still wanted to look ahead of the curve. Sure enough, this thing is incredibly unpleasant to look at, partly because it's blinding white and partly for a reason I'll address near the end of this video. But in every other way, this is no different than the other machines I've shown you. I'm not even bothering to show you more than a glimpse of the interface because it'll put you to sleep like melatonin. The features are all very basic. All these things are pretty much the same. They all have floppy drives. Um, all of them can read PC disks. Although, for some reason, the brother machines I showed you earlier use a format that stores only 240 kilobytes and can't be read by anything else. I can't explain that. The Sony three and a half inch floppy has never sucked that much. Even the incredibly early Mac floppies from 1984 stored 400K, so how brother screwed this up is anyone's guess, but nobody else had that problem. Uh, all these machines have spell check features, uh, which was actually not a universal thing on PCs. You often had to buy a separate spell check package, but I imagine almost everyone did, so this is probably moot. Uh, also, since these are computers, a few of them include other apps, uh, particularly spreadsheet programs, but those are also nothing to write home about. Uh, here's one of them on the Smith Corona. It's just a basic VisiCalc clone that's only remarkable because it's glued to a printer. In theory, the Brother WP3410 would have a spreadsheet app as well, but apparently you had to load that from an included disk, which nobody has anymore. This, I guess, could be an interesting feature. Uh, it's not surprising that a computer can run programs off a disk, wow. But it does mean that if you were really, really, really bored, you could probably write your own custom software for one of these. But I don't recommend you spend your one life that way. Let me get real with you for a moment. I'm generally very much against the practice of gutting old computers and replacing the insides with a Raspberry Pi or whatever. That's a great way to take something potentially interesting and turn it into something that's exactly the same as a $200 Walmart laptop and will shortly thereafter go in a drawer or a closet and never get turned on again. But in this one case, I'm going to insist that you do that with these things because it's the only reasonable thing you could do to keep them from becoming landfill fodder. Here's why. Despite being dedicated typing devices, actually typing on one of these sucks. It's just not very good by modern standards. By the standards of the mid 80s, I'm sure they were just fine, probably much more pleasant than a typewriter, but if you have fantasies about using one of these as a distraction-free writing machine, honestly, just don't waste your time. The keyboards, for one thing, are crap. The only keyboards you could get in the 80s that were good by modern standards were on the IBM PC and some of its clones. Everything else falls off in quality fast, and these are no exception. I'm sure they use foam and foil or rubber mats inside. The keycaps are lightweight and shaky. They jam easily, and they are incredibly unpleasant to type on at high speed. Not that you could do that anyway, since the software is also very slow. I regularly dunk on old keyboards and computers for not being able to keep up with my typing. I understand that this is not fair. I understand that far fewer people could type at 180 words per minute in the 80s, and not that many people can do so even now. But here's the thing. I don't know why any computer in existence shouldn't be able to handle it anyway, and these, for some reason, can't. Every single keystroke on one of these machines carries something like a quarter second delay before it appears on the screen. It's always lagging behind your typing, no matter how slow you are. And while these all have keystroke buffers, if I type anywhere close to my max speed, they all start dropping keystrokes. Some only when wrapping at the end of a line, some mid-word, but they all do it. And even if you don't type that fast, it's still just unpleasant seeing your words appear with such extreme lag. I don't know how fast the processors in these things are, but even if they were measured in kilohertz, the job they're doing is just so simple. Process keyboard input, store the characters in memory. That should be it. 
To be fair though, maybe these don't do video output the way the PC did. On an old school PC graphics card, the text is rendered by the card itself with zero CPU impact, except when it's updating the screen. Maybe these don't work that way and the CPU is responsible for rendering the contents of memory into a bitmap to feed the screen. Maybe there's no video memory and the CPU has to race the beam to keep the display updated. If that's the case, then maybe it makes sense that these are so slow. Adding the hardware to allow the video output to be rendered independently of the CPU might have made them as expensive as a PC, halfway defeating the purpose, but whatever the reason, I still feel that they're really not very fun to type on in 2023. If I somehow haven't made my point yet, it's this. These machines resist any effort to love them. Other than the basic aesthetic, which does vibe very hard indeed, they're just old and crappy and pointless, and they sort of were when they were new. You might have assumed that since these are dedicated single-purpose devices, they'd have a leg up on just a program running on a contemporary PC, but this isn't true. The PC, even in 1981, years before any of these were sold, was a vastly superior word processing platform. If you wanted to write letters, an essay, or a book, a PC was better than any hardware word processor I've tried. Assuming, of course, that you could afford it, had the space for it, and understood how to use it. IBM PCs were originally thousands of dollars, and that was in 1980s money, so we're talking about a fortune here. And this remained closer to true than not for pretty much the rest of the decade. A circa 1987, for instance, Kiplinger's personal finance said that you might want to just buy a PC instead of a word processor, since they were now coming down in price to less than $1,500. Ouch. A Tandy 1000SX, a kind of mid-range, low-end machine, was still about a grand, and that was for just the PC, the monitor, and the keyboard. A printer was extra, so was the word processor software. Meanwhile, a Magnavox video writer, uh, very similar to my brother WP75, only cost $600. It was also a complete integrated unit with the display, floppy drive, keyboard, printer, and software all in one box. That's a huge difference in both cost and convenience, especially since you didn't need to learn how to use a whole general purpose computer just to write a few letters. And on that point, a lot of people probably were not into computers. They were only looking for a replacement for their existing typewriter. And I need to harp on this. Part of why it's so unfair of me to dunk on these things for not handling my machine gun typing rate is that typing used to just be different before PCs became universal. I don't have first-hand experience of this, but as I understand it, fast typing on a typewriter was a very different technique than what we do now. And if you transferred it to an electronic keyboard, then you basically got a huge improvement in speed and comfort without otherwise changing anything. Very probably, a lot of buyers only wanted to move forward from a typewriter at all because they recognized that they were relics from the 19th century. That didn't mean they were ready to jump into the deep end of the 20th. So, all of these reasons may have justified the existence of these word processors, but the fact remains that, as far as I can tell, if you were a nerd, these were just never state-of-the-art. They were never the best way to write text. They were just crappy, single-purpose computers that didn't even do their one job very well. So I just spent uh, 10, 15 minutes telling you how boring these things are. So is there anything here you want to see? Well, probably. The fact is that there are interesting word processors out there. There aren't many, but they do exist. However, many of them aren't from the US. Japan and several other Asian countries have a long history of dedicated word processors with extremely wide ranging and interesting feature sets. I even have one. This is the Panasonic U1 Pro 607. It is absolutely fascinating, and I don't read or speak Japanese. This thing is wild. Uh, I have no idea when it's from, but it seems like it should just be a PC. I mean, it's so sophisticated. It's designed like a laptop. It's got this huge backlit bitmap screen, and right from the jump, it seems to offer a whole array of programs but I can't get most of this to make sense through machine translation, so I'm totally lost. I can say there are at least Japanese and English typing modes, and then it looks like there might be a, a spreadsheet on here, uh, graphics features, maybe a terminal mode. Maybe this thing has games, I have no idea. Um, it seems to have pretty advanced hardware features too. Um, if we take a look at the sides here, we've got a cartridge port there, and then around on the other side, uh, we not only have the floppy drive, we also have some sort of external interface here, some sort of weird D-sub there, and uh, even a, a PCM-CAA slot here for a ROM card. 
This thing seems massively overbuilt for an electronic typewriter. And it still has severe input lag that can't keep up with my typing. So I'd love to tell you what this thing is all about, but I'm just totally clueless and definitely the wrong person for the job. It does, however, at least make it clear that there are greater dimensions to the world of word processors. And yet, it wasn't until a few days ago that a fellow gatherer of strange things finally dropped a machine on me that gave me something I could talk about. Although I'm glad he didn't literally drop it on me because I don't think I would have survived. <sighs> this is the Olivetti ETB2700 and Besides anything else about it, it is the biggest goddamn typewriter I've ever touched. The, uh, the platen, the part that holds the paper in place, is 17 inches wide. I can only imagine this is for like putting a, a tabloid or an A2 sheet in there sideways. I don't know why you do that, but I guess people must because there it is. Now, I've always had a kind of a soft spot for Olivetti. Uh, they're an Italian company that originally just made typewriters. Some incredibly, unbelievably stylish typewriters, in fact. Uh, and later on, they made many other stylish things, including, eventually, computers. As far as I know, their PCs were mostly ordinary, other than having incredibly aesthetically pleasing vents. Uh, the Olivetti M24 was resold under both the Xerox and AT&T brands, which makes it kind of historically interesting, but I don't think there was anything that remarkable about the machine itself. It makes sense, though, that this company, makers of both typewriters and computers, would make a computerized typewriter, which is, of course, what this is, if the uh, dual floppy drives on the left weren't a giveaway. But, well, for all this thing's immense bulk, you may notice that it has no built-in display. Like the little brother machine from earlier, this requires a separate monitor to operate, but unlike the brother, it really can't be used at all without one. And that'll put you in a pickle if you ever come across one of these, and I decided to start this video by illustrating this particular problem instead of explaining anything about how the machine works because I want you to get an idea of just how alien this thing is. To get to the video output, we have to take this rear cover off and the video output is this RCA plug over here and it's actually got a DC plug next to it. If we pull these cables out, this one here is just a, a plain old RCA cable, that's for the video. And then it's got a double-ended DC barrel jack cable. So you plug that in there, it supplies 12 volts. And I guess uh, that the monitor they supplied with this thing when you bought it ran off of DC, which is an interesting way to do it. I've never actually seen a, a home computer of any kind that used DC to run the monitor. Uh, but I don't have that monitor, so I had to wing it. What exactly comes out of this RCA cable. Well, since this came out in 1988 and it's a single RCA output, you'd probably figure that it's ordinary composite video. That was common with home computers and, and even PCs at the time. Uh, the IBM PC convertible, for instance, had a plug much like this for connecting its beautiful nine inch green phosphor CRT. And despite the low resolution of CGA text mode, that gave a very crisp and readable display. Uh, IBM also drove the internal display in their PC portable via an internal composite interface, as did other luggable PC vendors. So this was a well-respected technique and it seems very reasonable here. So let's give that a shot. Here's the monitor from the PC convertible. Let me just power this up and we'll plug the cable in here. All right, moment of truth. Uh, well, that's not it. Something's there, but it's obviously not very happy with it. This probably won't cause any damage, but I'm gonna turn it off just to be safe. Now this monitor takes ordinary composite video at NTSC frequency, which I demonstrated in an earlier video by feeding it a camera image. That worked fine. It also looked really good. So clearly the Olivetti is not outputting NTSC compliant video. It took me hours to figure out what is coming out of this thing. My first guess at why this didn't work, and probably yours as well, was that this might be outputting a PAL signal. That's a good guess if I do say so myself, it fits the evidence. Olivetti is an Italian company and PAL was the dominant TV standard at the time. Ignoring the issue of color encoding, PAL and NTSC are not that dissimilar other than their frequency. So you may very well indeed get a distorted picture if you feed PAL into an old, unintelligent NTSC display. That makes sense. 
Now, conversely, uh, you might think that doesn't make sense because this machine, although it came from Italy, was modified for sale in the US. If we look at the sticker on the bottom, it says 110 volts, 60 hertz. Most devices converted like that are also converted to NTSC. But consider this, they sold a monitor with the machine. Why bother changing the video standard? Uh, you might think it's because the line frequency is different here, but the reality is that almost no CRT in history ever timed itself off of wall current. They all had internal oscillators, and PAL displays will work just fine on 60 hertz. So Olivetti absolutely could have shipped PAL displays even in the US as long as they told buyers that they were only for use with the ETV. So this is a plausible theory. It's also completely incorrect. I own a whole variety of multi-format monitors, you know, PVMs, stuff like that. So generally speaking, I don't care if stuff is PAL or NTSC. So let's just go ahead and plug this guy in. Hmm. Well, that's not syncing. And I know this can do NTSC and PAL, so that's not it either. I tried a couple other PVMs. Uh, I tried some LCD broadcast monitors. I even tried a much newer Dell PC monitor with a composite input just for kicks, but everything produced either different kinds of trashed images or no image at all. So this is definitely not PAL. Now I thought maybe one of my capture cards would work. So I tried that, no luck, but someone recently loaned me one of these modded GBS arcade video converters and I thought, that might do some good. So I tried it and I got a bit of a lead. I have to say, I find this thing very finicky. Even when I feed it clean VGA signals, it seems to just randomly lose sync or misinterpret the resolution. So in 20 minutes of experimentation, I only got it to sync to the Olivetti a couple of times. It then only produced a fraction of the display. So in general, it failed me, but when it was supposedly in sync, I noticed that the screen claimed it was getting a 70 Hertz signal. Assuming this is true, it explains our problem. No standard television monitor is ever going to sync to a 70 hertz picture. That's why nothing I tried worked. But it doesn't leave a lot of options. What can sync to that? Well, if you're ever in this situation yourself, the answer is an awful lot of VGA monitors. VGA text mode ran at 70 hertz, so all VGA monitors have to support it, and a decent number also support sync on green, a technique where a TV-style composite sync pulse is merged into the green component of the VGA signal. Now, I don't have a monitor handy that supports this, but I do have an Extron VGA to HDMI scaler with incredibly wide signal tolerances. Sure enough, when I connected the Olivetti's video output to the green pin of a VGA breakout cable, just like that, I got a picture. And here's what that picture revealed. It's a post diagnostic, which tells us the most interesting thing about this machine right up front. It has an NEC V40 CPU. This is exciting because the V40 is an x86 processor. NEC, by the way, was a huge manufacturer of x86 compatible CPUs in the 1980s, starting with their V20, which got used in tons of PC clones and sold as a drop-in upgrade for normal PCs. Uh, they also produced the V30, an upgraded version of the same thing. And then they made the V40, which is sort of a different thing. Some Googling suggests that it's kind of like Intel's 8186. Uh, basically, it's an upgraded 8086 but with some built-in peripherals, like a DMA controller and an interrupt timer that make it more convenient for embedded applications. We'll explore this a little bit more later on in the video. There were a few PC-like devices sold with 8186 CPUs, uh, like the Deck Rainbow 100, for instance, but they were generally not fully PC compatible. They required custom versions of DOS and they wouldn't run a lot of PC software. This has neither of those problems though. I'll demonstrate this more later, but I can tell you upfront that I've booted ordinary MS-DOS 6.2 on here with no trouble. And in fact, it shipped with MS-DOS 3.2. I have the original boot disk here. And if we put this in, we start booting. And this takes a really surprisingly long time. It's about 45 seconds from startup to launching the software. But at last, here we are. This is the word processor package, uh, which Olivetti gave the cryptic name SWP. Although there's some dispute on that. Wikipedia has an enormous block of text completely unsighted that says that this was originally called SWS and that that was short for Secretary's Workstation. That seems reasonable. It goes on to mention the term SWP in several other places, so it seems like Olivetti renamed it. Fair, I have no reason to dispute that. 
But James Meng does. He's some guy who commented on the disks that someone uploaded to Internet Archive, and he said this, I am 100% certain that this software archive is a fraud, built recently from source code. There's this version in Italian, and there's also an English version kicking around. Why? Because the software was actually called SWS, not SWP. This whole thing is a stupid British penis joke by a child sitting around with some old source code, a virtual machine, and a compiler. The British README even references stiffy floppies. Give me a break. This is abusive of the historical record. I'm not saying it should be taken down because the software does work and otherwise seems exactly right, but the little penis joke by a British loser is not helpful at all. Just post the source code, please! James, I regret to inform you, they just changed the name. <laughs> Who could possibly think that the single letter P was somehow a dick joke? I don't get it. And uh, Stiffy Floppy, while hideously embarrassing, at least in modern American English, was genuinely a term used for three and a half inch floppies when they first came out in some places, cause you know, they aren't floppy. So people thought they should have a new word. It didn't stick, thank God, but it makes sense that it was tried. And you can confirm this in five seconds on Google. But if you're posting on the internet in 2022 and trying to correct someone, maybe go to Google for five seconds and type in the thing you're mad about. <laughs> SWP is not a dick joke. It's just the name they used. I have no idea what it stands for. Software word processor, maybe? Who knows? Who cares? Let's move on. The copyright date confirms this is from 1988, uh, but curiously, the spell checking dictionary is only copyright 1984. Did they use a four year old dictionary? Probably. I've noticed this in other word processors as well. The dictionary is always years out of date. Maybe Webster just didn't put out updated digital versions every year. Who knows? But at any rate, here we are at the main menu. Now, since this is both old and not a conventional PC app, the UI and the terminology are a bit strange. Some of this is probably due to rough translation, but being Italian doesn't excuse all the weirdness of the UI. For instance, you'd expect to see new document and load document, but instead there's a single combined create modify print option. If we pick that, it asks us to put in the name of a text. SWP calls documents texts. It's an Albany expression. Uh, now, if we want to load a file, we have to type out the name. I mean, we don't pick the file. There's no browse files option. You have to have memorized the name of the files on your disk and gotten the right file name beforehand. So if we don't type the exact name of an existing file, it just assumes that we want to make a new one. If you don't know what file you want when it asks, you're just stuck, unless you know that the exit key, tucked down here in the corner of the keyboard and nearly invisible, will cancel this prompt. Of course, even that is smoother than what happens if you do create an empty file. You just get stuck here in the text editor because the exit button does nothing here for some reason. So you'll be unable to leave until you figure out that the command for leaving is control Q. Very intuitive. If my theory about these being angled towards computer unfamiliar consumers is accurate, then you'd expect the software to avoid leaving users in the lurch like this. You would expect them to do better than the average PC software package at the same time at leading you into the correct next action. But even WordStar from 1983 showed you what files were on your hard drive in the load dialog. So Olivetti failed to achieve the ease of use of a then five year old PC app. This stings. Unfortunately, the standard PC word processor of the era, WordPerfect, had this exact same problem. A lot of computer stuff just sucked in surprising ways in the 1980s because you were simply expected to devour and memorize the entire manual before you so much as launched the app. This definitely suffers from that problem. Probably more importantly than any of that, however, this was not the first Olivetti ETV. It was actually the eighth or 10th model. The first one, the ETV 300, came out all the way back in 1982 when the software industry was far less mature. And I'd guess that this machine is intended to work very much like that one did so that anyone upgrading wouldn't have to relearn how to use it. That meant they had to retain design philosophies from the Stone Age. You can at least go back to the menu and ask it to display list of texts to see the files on your disk. Oh, wow, it actually asked me the drive name this time. Every single time I've done this before, it would only look at the A drive. I could never figure out how to point it to the B drive. It never asked me this. Man, whatever. So here's our list of files on the disk, but we still can't just select something. Uh, we have to take the name that we see here 
and like write it down on a piece of paper and take it back to the other screen and type it in manually. Or what we can do is we can go back, select this again, and then there's an option to print the list. So let's get some paper. Now, one strange thing about this machine that's not true for any other word processor I have is there's no knob. Normally with typewriters and word processors, there's a big knob on the side you can use uh, to advance the paper up and down. And there's usually also some way to do it electronically, but I haven't been able to find any good method for this. So uh, I'll show you more of this later, but there's an interface here for manually typing text directly to the typewriter, and I have to go there and then just hit line feed over and over. It's the only way I figured out to get the paper into the machine. I have to assume I'm missing something. But anyway, let's tell it to print this list. So there's the printer for you. Uh, it's fairly quick, it's fairly quiet. Uh, this uses a, a thing called a, uh, I think it's a carbon ribbon or a transfer ribbon, something like that. It's the same sort that's used in the IBM Selectrix, for instance. It doesn't use ink, it uh, just sort of mashes some like plastic or carbon onto the paper. In short, it just means that any cartridge you find for a machine like this will definitely still work, no matter how old it is. Uh, and of course, uh, being a daisy wheel, the quality is pretty damn good. No real complaints there, it's just like every other daisy wheel from the era. If we look at this listing though, you'll notice that all the files are listed as a name, a size, and a comment. Uh, you can give your documents this little description of what they contain, which is important because this uses a standard FAT file system, so it's limited to eight character file names. Using FAT was crucial though, because it let you copy files to and from a PC. Uh, the native OTX format that this saves is gibberish in a standard PC editor, but this can open PC text files, so I imagine all of Eddie provided a converter tool for going the other way. Now this video is not about this thing as a word processor. I'm not gonna deep dive the software, but I wanna give you an idea of what it can do. It's not a masterpiece of document creation by modern standards, but the editor itself does have a number of advanced features that I don't think any other word processor I've seen had. I mean, to be unfair, it still can't keep up with my typing. But other than that, it does seem pretty feature rich. Uh, the keyboard, which is enormous compared to the other word processors I have, offers gobs of special keys, some clearer than others. Many of them just beep and don't explain what I did wrong, which is a very 80s experience, but others are straightforward. If I press the footnote button, for instance, uh, it actually adds a footnote. I can put in as many of these as I want, uh, and each pops up this little sub-editor, so you can put in whatever text you like, and then when you close this, it just collapses into a single number, uh, and you can then open it up later and edit it if you like. This is pretty dope. Uh, there's also a header and footer feature, uh, which is so advanced that I actually cannot figure out all the stuff it can do. There's settings in here for like, defining columns and numbering the pages and all sorts of stuff. It's bewildering. Uh, there's also an outline feature that I can't begin to figure out uh, and there's a table feature I can't begin to figure out. It puts in this big mass of pounds and dots and I have no idea what that does. Each document seems to have a 65,000 character limit, uh, which for reference is just barely long enough to contain the script for this enormous video. So it makes sense that they included a full text search feature. There it is. You can not only search for text, but it actually has a dedicated find next button, which I don't think I've seen on anything before. Another neat thing is this notepad button in the lower left. If you hit this, it pops up another little window and it asks you for a file name. This is sort of a, a micro sub editor. This is just for quick notes. So it saves to its own file format that won't overwrite any proper document you're working on with the same name. There's not a lot of multitasking in this era of computing. So usually when you see little glimpses of it, it'll be little custom features like this. And this is a pretty clever one if you ask me. 
There's also an option down here called insert text. Uh, you press that, you can put in the name of another document and it'll just paste the entire thing into your current project in its entirety. So you can save reusable boilerplate, stuff like that, and then recall it instantaneously. Uh, there's also a cut and paste mode. Now, very often in these days, uh, cut and paste were kind of awkward operations on devices like this in particular. This one's not too bad. You hit the button, and then you scroll down to the end of the segment you wanna work on. And then you can choose to, to cut, you can choose to copy, uh, but you can also tell it to just take that chunk of text and save it directly into a new document, which is cool. Or you can tell it to apply text attributes. About that. At first, I thought that this thing had no rich text features because generally speaking, daisy wheel printers can't produce any of those. Uh, dot matrix printers sort of can, but on a daisy wheel, it forms the entire letter in one strike. So things like italics are impossible without physically changing wheels. Uh, it can do underlines, but those were a common trick way back to the beginning of mechanical typewriters. Uh, that's actually why the underscore character exists. Uh, the idea is that you would type your text and then you would move the head back and then type a series of underscores and you'd get an underline. Well, this can automate that process. Uh, every time it prints a letter, it can then skip back and underscore it automatically. Even cooler though, this can make fake bold text by printing the same character over and over while moving the head almost imperceptibly forward every time. All right, these are the five text decoration modes, normal, underlined, bold, bold, underlined, and a thing called reverse. I'm gonna print these all at once here. I'll just hit the print button until I want one copy. So this is kind of weird. For the first few, it works like I described. Uh, for the bold, you can see it just sort of hits the letter several times at slightly different positions. And for the underline, it just goes back and hits it with the underscore afterwards, just like a normal typewriter. All that's not remarkable. But then this inverse color here, this obviously doesn't work. It wastes a ton of ribbon, but it doesn't actually produce an inverted character. What I think is supposed to be going on is that this actually supports a correction ribbon, which I don't have. So I think what it's supposed to do is basically black out the entire area where the character should be and then come back, lift up the correction ribbon and then strike it one time to lift off just that part of the, the black ink. It seems incredibly wasteful. It chews up tons of ribbon. Uh, I wish I had the correction ribbon so I could prove it, but it doesn't really seem worth the amount of media it consumes. At any rate, uh, there's clearly a lot here, and it would be great if all this was backed up by a robust online help feature, but sadly those were not assumptions in the 80s. There is an attempt at one, however. There's a dedicated help key down here, and pressing that usually gives you some useful pointers about what actions you can take at the moment. Uh, for instance, if a new user isn't so helpless that they don't bother to look for and press a key clearly marked help, then they would be informed that the shortcut to exit the text editor is control Q. That's how I figured out how to get out of it. So I admit that I haven't thoroughly explored everything my other word processors can do, but I'm pretty convinced that almost none of this stuff is on the table. I think I might've seen a bold text button somewhere. Maybe that was a common trick, but otherwise this thing seems far and away more capable than the brothers or the Smith Corona. Now, uh, I did want to address this again. Uh, one feature that was common on these things and very much worth discussing, the typewriter mode button. Most word processors, no matter how sophisticated their editing interface was, offered a button that reduced the device to a simple electronic typewriter. Everything you enter goes straight to the printer mechanism, skipping the editor completely. This is very convenient for things like uh, filling out forms. You can roll a form into the machine, carefully line up the type head with a field, and then just fill in that field one letter at a time before manually moving on to the next field and so on. Doing something like that's pretty tough uh, to do accurately from the normal document editor where you enter text and then print it all at once. So this is an important feature and it shows up on every word processor. I like how this one works though. When we hit the button, it pops up this little window and this appears over whatever else you're doing. It shows a bunch of status info, like your uh, current position on the page, the locations of the left and right margins and printer settings, like how hard the hammer hits and how many lines it advances when you hit return. You can also enable the text emphasis, uh, underline, bold, etc. cetera. Uh, but you can also move this window up, down, 
left, and right, so you can type while referring to whatever's hidden behind it. Again, with multitasking being an incredibly rare thing in these days, this is a pretty neat trick. I should also mention there's a couple other operating modes back on the main menu. Uh, for instance, uh, as I said, people use typewriters to fill out forms, but if you're doing a lot of the same form, then you might want to use the pre-printed forms feature. A lot of word processors offered something like this. I think three of mine do. The idea is that you put in a blank copy of a form, and then you go through a wizard process that defines the locations and the names of every field. You save that as a template, and then later you can fill out that template by just entering all the field values. Once they're all entered, you roll in a blank copy of the form, you hit print, and the printer just zooms to each form field and fills them all in super quick. I would love to demo this one, but it really does require the manual. It's completely inscrutable. I tried and utterly failed. The other mode here is merge. That's uh, short for mail merge. This is for things like uh, printing customer billing notices. Uh, it allows you to write a single boilerplate document and then print that over and over, just changing the values in certain fields automatically, like the name, the salutation, the amount owed, that sort of thing. Likewise, I tried to figure this out to demo for you, but it was incomprehensible. And at any rate, like I said, neither of those features are unique at all. And I think with that, you've seen pretty much everything that this machine can do. And you know, I'm someone who's sat down and compared seven different word processors, so I'm going, damn, this thing's kind of sick. But I imagine that you, the viewer, are yawning like a kid in a carpet store at this point. It's a word processor. That's all it is. I mean, this one doesn't even have a spreadsheet. But that's where things get interesting. This is a PC clone at its heart. It doesn't just use a PC compatible processor, it really is a PC, and Olivetti actually marketed it that way. It's not just that using a XA6 CPU was the cheapest way to build an electronic typewriter, or at least if that was their reasoning for choosing it, they didn't stop there. They could have taken steps to obscure the underlying DOS system, but they didn't. If we go back to the menu and simply pick exit the program, we're thrust unceremoniously into DOS. The entire software suite that I just finished showing you is just a program. Uh, you can see swp.exe, that's what we were running. That's in autoexec.bat, uh, so it runs as soon as you boot, but you could just remove that line and this thing would simply stop being a word processor forever until you told it to be one again. The only other component that makes this special is a file called etvdd.sys. Uh, this loads from config.sys on startup uh, as a device driver. But I should point out that under DOS, driver was a much looser definition than what we think of nowadays. It's mostly just a chunk of code that's left sitting in memory with some interrupt vectors pointing to it. And what you could do with that was pretty wide ranging. The primary function of this driver is to make the printer work. See, the actual typewriter mechanism shows up as a parallel printer. So if I just uh, type in some junk here, and I send that to LPT1, uh, which is the DOS uh, virtual device for the parallel port, it prints it just like that. But I don't think that the typewriter mechanism actually is connected to a conventional parallel port, because if I remove that driver from config.sys, then nothing happens when I try to print. So in other words, this driver seems to be emulating a parallel port device. I'll ruminate more on that later. But it also does more than that. All right, I just took out the Olivetti software and I rebooted using my DOS 6 disk that I made from scratch on my PC. The only thing I've brought over here is that etvdd.sys. The SWP software isn't even present. And yet, if I hit the typewriter button, look at that, it pops right up and I can type stuff. Uh, this actually even works if I'm in another program. All right, this is DOS edit, which didn't come out for like five years after this machine was made. But if I hit the typewriter button, it pops right up over it. I can type some crap. And then when I hit the button again, it goes right back to my program. This kind of trick was not uncommon in the DOS era. It's another very early rudimentary form of multitasking that's usually executed via something called a TSR, but apparently the same trick can be done with a device driver. I had not known that. Here's another thing. Since this is pretending to be an ordinary parallel printer, that means I can hit print screen and it'll print the screen. I think you're off sides there, bud. This is neat, but it brings us to a very important issue. If I'm honest, I didn't actually hit print screen. I hit shift and the delete key. 
Now a normal PC keyboard doesn't have a delete key, it has a backspace. But on a typewriter, the term backspace simply means to move the type head back a character. You can't delete with a typewriter, so already maintain that behavior. You hit this in SWP, it just moves back, it doesn't actually delete. If you want to move back and delete, well, you need a new key for that, so they added this one. But if you're not in the SWP software, Backspace does exactly what it would on a normal PC. On the other hand, if I hit this delete key, it prints an asterisk, unless I hold shift, in which case it prints the screen like I showed you. Now this threw me for a loop for a couple of days until I thought to take a look at an original PC keyboard and remembered that print screen used to be on the asterisk key. It was actually that way all through the AT keyboard, uh, all the way up until the Model M when IBM completely changed the keyboard layout. I keep forgetting how weird the early PC keyboard was before that point. Look at one sometimes, it's, it's like it's from Mars. Now this machine came out years after that change happened, but I guess since it was based on XT era hardware, they kept the old school key codes. Unfortunately, however, they didn't go with any of the standard layouts. As far as I can tell, every normal PC key is on here, but some are very hard to find. Uh, for instance, the uh, faint gray labels on the left key block reveal that these are the function keys, and they're actually in the same place they'd be on a normal keyboard. I mean, not one that would come with a new PC in 1988, but these are where a lot of PC users were used to seeing them at the time. It's still very hard to read the labels though, so using them is awkward. Uh, the numpad area is also quite a mess. Everything's been jumbled around, all sorts of things have changed. Uh, also the escape key is labeled exit, and it's all the way down here. And, and this is weird in several ways. On the original PC keyboard, escape was in the upper left, where we have it nowadays. On the PC AT keyboard, it was at the upper left of the numpad for some reason, but this placement is unlike both of those standard layouts. Great. Uh, there's also a number of characters like the greater and lesser than signs and the backslash that only exist as these light gray labels. And I couldn't figure out how to get to any of these for several days. Uh, holding shift just gets you the capital letter from those buttons. As it turns out, these are on a third layer of symbols that you get to by holding a key that usually only exists on non-US keyboards uh, called Alt-Graph. But of course on this one, it's way over in the corner and it's labeled KB2. Yeah, you know uh, keyboard? They finally made a sequel. So in short, if you're used to computers and you try to type on this thing, you're gonna feel like Sideshow Bob, tripping with every step you take. But despite that, all the critical keys are here somewhere, and that means that we should be able to run just about any piece of software. So let's do that. Well, that's not a valid command. And just like that, the ETV does have a spreadsheet. But unlike the one on the Smith Corona, it's not an AirSats VisiCalc, you know, a relic of the Apple II era. This is an actual complete full featured spreadsheet app that's not years out of date. Of course, it's not the gold standard of the era either. That would have been Lotus 1, 2, 3, which I wanted to show you because it was sort of the benchmark by which people judged PC compatibility. Unfortunately, I don't have original disks and the disk level copy protection uh, made it impossible for me to make them. So instead I'm running Lotus Symphony, a lesser but still respected package. And as far as I can tell, it works perfectly. Um, I figured out enough of the keys that I'm able to, for instance, go in and load files. There we go. And I can, you know, adjust formulas and, and whatnot. Maybe there's some special features that you wouldn't be able to access due to some key that's not actually on here. I wouldn't know. But more importantly, I also don't know if it's necessarily worth the effort to find all of them. I don't know if this machine is worth the effort, honestly, or the price. The ETV 2700 cost about $1,700 in 1988. That was considerably more than an equivalently specced PC. Maybe on par with a PC clone and a printer sold as a bundle though. As I said, there are reasons someone might not wanna replace their typewriter with a computer, but at the point where you're wanting to run existing software, why bother buying this instead of a PC? I mean, hell, pork way no lost dose. Unless you were really cramped for space, just keep the typewriter for the occasional pre-printed or multi-part form, and use the PC for everything else. That seems like a much better use of your time than trying to train yourself to run Lotus through this Enigma machine of a keyboard. It would make a lot more sense if you could plug in an external keyboard and use a, a normal layout, but Olivetti didn't provide a port for some reason. 
In fact, they didn't provide much in the way of interfaces. There are, for instance, no parallel or serial ports, despite those being absolutely universal on all PCs by 1988. Now, the first one I get, the typewriter is your line printer, so I, I guess you can get away without a parallel port, but why no serial? Those have been universal for years, and this thing could have dialed into a remote system and operated like a, a 1960s style TTY terminal, and I know there were people who would have appreciated that. There are also no expansion slots, or at least no ordinary ones. On the back here, uh, next to the video ports, there's this big, funky multi-pin thing. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time speculating, but suffice to say, that's probably an ISA port in disguise. Um, one ad did claim that there was a 20 megabyte hard drive accessory. That probably plugged in there. It probably included its own controller card. There's also mention in the software of a communication mode, uh, but when you pick it, it just complains that the communication module isn't present. This makes me suspect that there actually was a serial port add-on that would have plugged in there. So yeah, this is probably a slot, but I doubt you could have added any peripherals of your own. And while we're talking about weird ways of doing normal PC things, I got a comment on the memory situation. I don't know that it's a problem, it's just kind of strange and I couldn't figure out where else to mention it in the script. This machine is more or less a PC XT, right? I mean, it's got a weird CPU, but architecturally it's closest to an XT. Yet, if we peek under this little cover on the back, we find SIM memory modules. And those weren't really a thing until well into the 286 era. Upgrading the RAM on XTs always involved stuffing a bunch of raw DIP ICs into sockets, or buying an ISA card with a bunch of DIP ICs on it, and even really late XT boards still worked that way as far as I can tell, so this seems kind of out of place. Even stranger though, per what little published info I can find, this machine claims to max out at 768K, while normal XT machines maxed out at 640K, and that's generally taken as an unbreachable barrier. From what I've heard, however, this is not actually a hardware limitation. It's just due to how the PC used memory mapped IO. So there were clones that expanded on this, but I wonder how much software was actually able to take advantage of it without modifications. Another thing that's weird and maybe bad is the monitor situation. I'm sure, as we discussed with the video signal being so strange, the only display that would have ever worked with this was the one that came with the machine, and that sucks. But the monitor itself was probably pretty good. It was apparently 12 inches, the same size as IBM's original PC display, and it was monochrome, so I'm sure it looked great, even if it definitely looked strange perched up on those weird little monitor arms that all of Eddie seemed to love. But if you didn't like it for some reason, or if it broke, well, too bad, because thanks to the bizarre proprietary video interface, you couldn't replace it with anything else. That sucks. And an even more concrete complaint is that this machine operates solely in MDA text mode, an astonishing limitation for 1988. MDA was unspeakably ancient at this point, given that PCs were selling with EGA and even VGA cards. MDA, on the other hand, originated with the first IBM PC seven years earlier, and it seemed anachronistic even then, having no support for per-pixel graphics whatsoever, only fixed width text. I don't know if any clone vendor ever shipped a machine with plain MDA. There was no point. You could just include a Hercules compatible card instead. They were cheaper and much more capable. The Herc was basically an MDA card if IBM had finished it. It's pretty much the same design. It just has enough RAM for a full screen frame buffer. They were incredibly popular and I suspect that IBM wanted to make something like it. And if RAM prices in 1981 had been just a little bit cheaper, they probably would have and the text only MDA never would have existed. By the time the ETV 2700 came out, however, seven years after all that happened, memory prices had plummeted. So it's wild that they would go with this prehistoric video standard. I mean, sure, the ETV was only meant for text editing, but if they were selling it as a PC, why exclude all the Hercules compatible business software already on the market? This is even more shocking when you realize that Olivetti was not limited to whatever they could afford to buy. By all appearances, they made the graphics hardware in here from scratch. I don't normally do blow by blows of disassembling stuff, but I was surprised at how nice it is to take this thing apart, so I wanted to share this with you. There's only a couple screws, one at the back and then two at the front. And by the way, if you ever get one of these things, the front screws are these very strange 5.5 millimeter hex heads. So you want the exact same driver that you'd use to take apart an IBM Model M keyboard, if you happen to have one of those. 
With those bolts out, you then have to press in a tab and slide the floppy drive cover forward to remove it. Then you press a plastic tab near the back of the chassis and the top cover lifts right off. Unplug the ribbon from the typewriter carriage, then four or five cables from the various motors, and then the entire typewriter mechanism just lifts right out. Now remove about eight more hex heads holding on the RF shield and lift it up to reveal the motherboard. How easy was that? So here's the motherboard and boy howdy is it a weird one. Most PC motherboards at the time had a lot more chips than this since they used ordinary CPUs that needed tons of support hardware. All the features that are integrated into the V40 mean that it requires very little support hardware. And as a result, almost everything we can see apart from the CPU seems to be purpose built for this particular machine and it's all indecipherable. This here is the V40 CPU itself. This is a BIOS chip. And I think this is another one. The RAM's back here. There's a single stick of soldered on memory and then two slots, one of which is occupied. So presumably both of these sticks are 256s since this machine apparently has 512K of RAM right now. You could add one more 256 to reach that 768K max. But that's all the easy parts. After that, it's all black boxes. This NEC chip, I can't find a data sheet for that at all. This TI chip is a gate array, so it's sort of like an FPGA, meaning it has completely custom internal functionality that can't be determined from the outside. Likewise, the remaining chips are all from VLSI, a well-known vendor of custom silicon, so it's impossible to say what any of them do without burning the tops off and reverse engineering the silicon dies. All we have are the cryptic code names on top, Octane, Oxide, and Overnight. So, it's impossible for me to tell you anything about how this works, except that it doesn't work like anything else. Almost all clones that implemented a standard IBM graphics interface were built around the Jellybean MC6845 CRT controller, or they used a third-party drop-in chip from ATI or Chips or Technologies or whoever, but this one simply has no hardware inside that isn't purpose-built. So it goes without saying that Olivetti had to have designed their own completely custom graphics array. And that makes sense since this doesn't actually output anything remotely like MDA video. The original IBM MDA card and the Hercules, which worked with the same monitors, used a TTL signal. That means that unlike the typical analog waveform used in composite TV signals and the like, which maxes out at about a volt, these cards output digital signals that are either on or off and they're at about three and a half volts. They also use separate horizontal and vertical sync signals like VGA, and they ran at 50 Hertz. That may seem strange given that they were sold in the US, but text only displays don't have much action going on. So you can use longer persistence phosphors and scan them less frequently, reducing the load on the video hardware. This is why old green CRTs have visible ghosting when text scrolls up the screen. This video interface, on the other hand, does nothing like any of that. I'm certain it's MDA from a software perspective, but the hardware is from Mars. It scans at 70 Hertz if the GBS is to be believed. It does not use TTL levels, but rather a fairly normal composite style signal that never exceeds 1.2 volts. And it uses a composite sync format that's integrated into the video signal, as we can see in this oscilloscope trace. I feel pretty confident saying that there's nothing else in existence that outputs this exact signal unless it came out of all of Eddie's labs. Cause there's really no reason to make anything that works like this. I mean, look at Brother. When they wanted an MDA like output, they just used MDA. They didn't even change the pinout. Why bother? Their word processor monitor works on a PC and the PC monitor works on their word processor because using parts that already exist costs less money. Why fight the feeling? Well, I'm lost on why they used an RCA plug, but I think I can at least explain the high refresh rate. If we look at a picture of the Olivetti's original monitor, it looks to be white. White phosphor has a much lower persistence than green or amber, so it has to be scanned faster to maintain a clear image. My Smith Corona, for instance, uses white phosphor and it seems to scan at 60 Hertz. I can't illustrate this on camera for you, but trust me, it's like staring into a strobe light. The flicker is horrible. Now, if you're thinking, Hey, wait a minute, didn't everyone's monitors run at 60 Hertz in the late nineties? Yes, an awful lot did, and they were murder on the eyes. A lot of people just didn't know how to recognize that. Those that did went out and bought monitors that could run at 70 Hertz. Switching to a higher refresh rate clears up the flickering. Unfortunately, in the late eighties, it also carried the cost of engineering a completely unique CRT and driver circuitry, but apparently that was worth it to Olivetti for some reason. Maybe green screens were considered gauche at that point? But even if the answer to that question seems clear enough, we still have many more questions. 
The amount of effort that Olivetti put into this thing doesn't seem to match up with the return. If they wanted a machine that could run PC software, this was not the way to do it. It's not terribly compelling as a PC given the weird keyboard and non-existent graphics support, among other things. It isn't a good form factor for a general purpose PC. It has no expandability. Its base specs were not great for the era and it was expensive. I almost feel like Olivetti didn't want to make a PC at all, but why do so in that case? Most other word processors on the market were Z80 based. So why go with x86 except to pursue PC compatibility? And why build a PC if you aren't gonna do a better job than this? I don't know, but in the end, that is what they did. And that means that this is a PC no matter what their intent was. And the beauty of the PC platform, the thing that keeps me fascinated with it is the same thing I always lament. Every PC, at least after the compatible clone market exploded in 1985, is essentially the same. They come off the Taco Bell menu. You can add this peripheral or that, you can use this CPU or that one, but you're always starting with ground beef, cheese, lettuce, and tortillas. That means that everything defaults to working. I picked Lotus Symphony because it was easy to run from a single floppy, but any MDA capable program should function on here. For instance, suppose you don't like the SWP software, but you like the typewriter mechanism, uh, you could just load up whatever you're comfortable with. Here I got a copy of WordStar, which I mentioned earlier. We can go in and load a document here and yeah, look at that, all of our files. Imagine showing the user the information that they need to know when you're asking them the question. Who knew? Here's a file, this uh, seems to be working perfectly. We should even be able to print. Print a file. One copy. No, no, one. Oh, I'm getting owned here. Oh, there we go. There it is, everything works perfectly. There might be a uh, text formatting features in this software that wouldn't work on here. Uh, I don't know, but for the most part, it looks like any old program will run on this thing. The fact the printer works seems the most surprising and maybe that's because Olivetti wanted to make sure that all software would work fine on here, but it's also possible that they just saw the least friction in making this follow the PC convention that one prints by sending data to the parallel port. It's just easiest to do things on the PC platform by doing them the right way. And all that means that even on this heavily constrained system with its outdated and bizarre graphics, its limited memory and confusing keyboard, you can actually play some video games. Obviously I'm talking about text adventures for the most part, but you can also run Rogue on here. You missed the bat. You missed the bat. The bat hits you. You missed the bat. You missed the bat. I'm about to lose to a single bat. I got an excellent hit on the bat. Hey, I won. This may seem like a stretch for the sake of the bit, but you wanna know something wild? This game, which is 43 years old at this point, is still pretty fun. You, you should try it sometime if you haven't. It has most of the core experiences of a modern action RPG and it's not even that hard to figure out. It even has an in-game help feature. When I was testing this thing before writing the script, I found myself just sitting and playing this for much longer than I intended because I was having a good time with a game from 1982 that runs entirely in text mode. That's pretty wild. But here's something wilder. Rogue didn't start out on the PC. It started out on deck mini computers. The only reason it got a PC port is because its original developer got a job at Olivetti when they were developing their first PC compatible machine. I didn't know that when I picked Rogue for this demo. I found out much later. I only picked Rogue because it pretty much runs on everything. In fact, I probably could have done this same gag with a much older machine, also from Olivetti. See, before they pivoted to making PC hardware, Olivetti built computers based on Z80 CPUs and the CPM operating system, including the early products in the ATV series. Well, as it happens, Rogue also received a CPM port. The hilarious result of this is that I'm able to run the game on my Sony SMC70, a bizarre video processor unit from 1983, and thus I have no reason to think that I couldn't also run it on the ETV300, Olivetti's first computerized typewriter from 1982. So, <laughs> there it is. I may have put a lot more words on the page for this video script than I had to, but this is the only interesting word processor I'm likely to ever find, so I've made sure it got its due. And now I cannot tell you how excited I am to get rid of the rest of these things because they do absolutely nothing for me. 
That leaves me a bit of a spot, to be honest, though. I don't have anywhere to keep this thing, but I can't bear to take it to the e-cycle store where it'll sit unsold for two months and then get thrown in a dumpster. I'm suddenly regretting my decision to accept this burden, but I'm sure I'll find it a good home. Certainly it had one before I got it. I was informed by the previous owner that when they received the machine, it came with a data disk that still had some user documents on it, and the last one was timestamped 2019. So either this thing sat in a closet for a few decades before someone inexplicably pulled it out to write some correspondence, or it was in continuous use for 31 years. That's kind of incredible. I'm not that surprised that the computer portion still works, but I'm very impressed that the print mechanism still functions, despite being absolutely caked with what appears to be old dried out grease. By all appearances, this thing is a real trooper, and I'm sure it has a few more years left to go. But you can all breathe a sigh of relief now because this video doesn't. We have finally reached the end. Thank you for watching. And I just wanna say, uh, I made up a lot of this stuff. So if you used one of these things back in the day, please leave a comment. I'd love to hear how wrong I am about all my assumptions. Especially if you have one of the CPM models to loan me, that'd be pretty dope. But if you just enjoyed the video, then consider subscribing to my channel so I know you like this sort of thing. Remember to turn on notifications if you want some slim chance of YouTube letting you know when I upload again. Uh, but if you really liked this, then consider supporting me on Patreon like these people here are doing. This channel is my sole source of income and I'm going through some rough times in life right now, a lot of costly problems stacking up. So I'm very thankful to my patrons who make it possible to get through all this crap without the additional stress of a day job. All the same, it does cost a lot to gather all this crap and pay for my studio and groceries and gas and so on. So anything you can do to help out would be appreciated. I'm incredibly grateful to everyone who's already supporting me though. I couldn't do any of this without them. So thank you all so much and everyone else. Thanks for watching.